Welcome back to the Figmentation Podcast. Figmentation is a nonprofit who works with traumatized children. We help them find their inner hero by making them the star of their own movie. So today we're going to be talking about, we're just going to kind of introduce ourselves. So yeah. um, why don't you go first? My name is Jeremy Bird. Um, everybody calls me Mama Bird. Yep. Um, why, do, why do people call you Mama Bird? Um, I have a, a overwhelming need to mother everybody. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, actually, she was given the nickname by yeah. um, actually not her children, but her extra children. So when I was a – before I was born, we had Rocky. Yeah. Who was just a little girl who lived down the street, and Rocky Rocky needed a safe place to be. So she was at our house. Yeah. Um, and that pattern continued clear yeah. through my childhood. I have dozens – of extra family siblings and and people who call us family and mm. we are grateful for every last one then of them. We love them. They are family. And so they they gave yeah. her the nickname of Mama Bird. Um well and, and so, my last name is Bird so. Yeah, that that helps. Yeah. That helps. So I'm Mama Bird um with the Figmentation Foundation. Um my title is Good Fairy and founder. And founder. Well, co-founder, one of the mm. founders. Yeah. We're both founders. <laughs> Um, I am a concept designer. I started in interior design and I specialized in freehand art and muraling. I did a lot of homes and decorated a lot of homes and met a lot of really neat people along the way. Um, and it sort of evolved. It evolved to my creativity and me testing how many other mediums could I get out into. And I I, I think that was probably just one of the ways that you you used your art to support yourself, but I don't think that's the primary of who you were. In what do you mean? Well, you're a costumer first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very first. Yeah, yeah. Probably. So she taught herself to sew and make costumes and clothing at Carol a very Brill very young age. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 8 or 9 yeah. when she taught me to sew. So, yeah. right. so but, tell me about the first costume you ever made. Um, I remember we had just moved to um, the town that I lived in as a child. Um, um, we moved – I was seven when we moved into this town, and, and um, it was Halloween. And I – the you know, the kids were all out trick-or-treating and everything, and, and um, I had a working mom. And so I wanted to go trick-or-treating. I wanted to go with my cousins, and I, I had to come up with something. And I was a dancer. I was in a little dance class. So I had little tutus and, and things like that. But so nobody made you a costume? No, you had to come up with what you could come up with. You know, like mm -hmm. Charlie Brown and the sheet with the multiple holes. <laughs> but um, I wanted to be a sugar plum fairy. So mm -hmm. I made myself a sugar plum fairy. I found a couple wire hangers and I found some white paper doilies and I glued them. And I put that with a little dance tutu. And How old were you? I was seven. Okay. So Five, seven, yeah, she's a she's a costumer at heart. So yeah, I've been doing that kind of creative stuff since I was little. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, um, and I thought that was normal. Um, I always won the costume contests as a kid, and I thought everybody's mom was like that until I became a mom, and I was like, um, costuming's hard. Can I just go buy one, please? <laughs> <laughs> I did not understand it or appreciate it well enough until I became a mother myself. Yeah. Well, it's it was a part – I was always a very um, incredibly imaginative kid, um, always embellishing what I saw because my brain would take it and it would become three-dimensional, a live – color. I was very visually acute, very, you know, intense. She, she sees things, sees things in three dimensions, walks around them, dissects them, puts them back together. It's more like unbuilding them and then rebuilding them yeah. in her so, brain. So I had a really cool little brain as a kid. And so my imagination always ran crazy. But so, so I've been this way since I was little. I've been mm -hmm. very imaginative, very expressive and, and costuming and things like that's been around since I was, you know, little enough to remember. So Anyways, um, so I got involved in, in concept design and design and, and costume design and props and sets and, and uh, visual design for 
productions and things of that nature, built big elaborate production props and big elaborate production costumes and things like that. So lots of fun. And, and it just got bigger and bigger as and, I got and older. You've, you've been doing this um, because people pay you to do it? No, sometimes. I mean, it just depends on um, the venue. You okay. Know, so when it's for kids, what happens? No, it's always free. <laughs> it's volunteer. It's always she's volunteer. she's been volunteering for for charities since I was a little girl. The first time I remember was the Jubilee of Trees that you made a tree for um, with a neighbor and friend. Yeah, uh, yeah. back when I was a little little girl. I know because she she used my lamb. I'll never forgive her. I did. I stole her lamb. For <laughs> it was image. a little stuffed animal. I had oh, hundreds of stuffed animals. I it was a beautiful tree. It was called Heavenly. Yeah, it was mm. really, really beautiful. And so she donated that. And that was one of the first times that, that I can remember you getting into charity. Um, but then you worked with the American Cancer Gala. Well, I did a lot of stuff for community and schools for all mm -hmm. my kids in their classrooms and school Absolutely. carnivals and classroom, you know, things like that. So right. I did end school productions and... Clear up to graduation right. parties. So yeah, been right. involved in that for a long, long time. Right. And you and typically that's that's a, a volunteer thing for you. Yeah. Um yeah. so she's she's always been a volunteer, Trees. always been a really good example of volunteering in the community and helping kids and and those in need. And that's been she's used her art in in ways that have really benefited our community. I can't I can't remember a time that she wasn't working on something for someone. Um, and, and that's really helped a lot of um, a community drama programs have been able to benefit from that and and even gone on to fund some of their their uh, yeah, drama programs have been funded by some of the things that you've made. You make things, do things, and they right. sell the, the product that you make them. And, right. Yeah. Or repairs so, and that kind of right. thing. So that's that's always been a really, really big talent of hers. And the community um, really has been impacted positively by by those contributions. So that's kind of who you are. Yeah. And I used to help with the American Cancer Society, Cancer Gala, on the on themes and decorating and mm -hmm. things of that nature as well. And backdrops I've painted and right. what have you. So, yeah, it's been it's who I am. It's what I do. Right. So that's who I am. So right. now let me introduce to you my daughter and co-founder of the Figmentation Foundation. I'm Jackie. Um, I'm a mother as much as she I have four of my own and lots of extras, and um, I have been a storyteller since I was born. I have been a a writer and and creator and artist for as long yeah. as I can remember. Even though it took me until my adult life to really recognize that that was the title that I was allowed to give myself, but I have always been always been a writer and. A storyteller. So yeah, she's always loved reading stories as well as telling stories. But, big reader, but writing has been her passion from the time she was a little girl. Creative Absolutely. writing, right? Well, and 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 um, and I've mentioned this in previous podcasts, but I, as a little girl, we had unicorns painted on our walls because our mom's a muralist, and why not? Because unicorns are cool. Because I'm that kind of kid. Um, and Dancing this was like Lisa Frank era of unicorns <laughs> right. and it's got, they are dancing and prancing. Right. It's the whole wall of, it's like a 12 foot wide wall of just unicorns and castles. And that's what I fell asleep to every night. And, and I shared a room with my baby sister and she and I were best friends and equally creative. She's very, oh, she's... very much a creative artist. And so every night she would tell me what she wanted in her story. Um, I would ask her, so what do you want? What what kind of characters do you want? What kind of adventure do you want? What do you want? And I would tell her a story until she fell asleep every night. Um, and those are some of her fondest memories of childhood, she'll tell you today. So that was a big part of, of and then I grew up with my own children. Um, and I didn't quite understand how important pretend play was when yeah, I had kids well, of my imagine, own to raise. Imaginative play was sort of the core in our home. Right. It absolutely was. I mean... Shoot, the idea of getting out a single toy was just bizarre to Jaina and I. Yeah. Just bizarre because I'm sorry, but Barbie has has a nemesis and Barbie's nemesis happens to be that bat that we hung up for Halloween decorations like five years ago that I'm not giving back because he's a good nemesis. <laughs> and there are village right. and cities and oh, roads and highways and trains and castles. Oh, and yeah. Ah, yeah. So imagination worlds. and play. We didn't need noisy toys. We didn't need we we played pretend. That yeah. was the important part of our our that was what 
made us happy. Yeah. But sometimes we'd tear apart the playroom. I mean, tear it apart. And <laughs> it never got added back designated together. playroom. Hey, <laughs> hey listen, listen. That the, We had card towers that, that – that bat was going to knock over kind of thing. We, right. we played, we played. Oh, and they made their dolls clothes and they, we did. <laughs> it was everything. It was just, that was how I learned how to sew, making Barbie clothes. Yeah. It was great. Um, um, so yeah, that's, that's who I am. And then I had four children of my own. I got married kind of young. I was, and I've been married now for half of my life. And, um, we have, we have four beautiful children and they are, great imaginators. And I didn't really understand the importance of imagination because like her brain, mine's a little bit unique. And it, I think in terms of logic and, and information and facts, and I store things in, in kind of a weird way in my head. And (laughs) don't make faces at the camera, mama. (laughs) SpongeBob going through the filing cabinets. (laughs) It is filing cabinets. That's what the inside of my brain looks like. Lots of filing cabinets. But uh, so I didn't understand the importance of it until my kids had been through something traumatic. And I realized what an impact that that imagination and imaginative play has on helping kids process their feelings. And realizing that I'd kind of I'd kind of left that part out of their childhood, even though I was blessed with that kind of a childhood. I realized that this was something I needed to fix. Fortunately, my kids were still young enough that we could do a lot of that. And we have. Yeah. And and that's helped a lot with them kind of coming out of that traumatic situation and kind of rebalancing themselves. So that's kind of who I am. Um, I am a writer. I'm a storyteller. I'm a mom and I'm a child advocate first and foremost. And I, I fight for my kids. And when I say my kids, I mean every child I can. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So that's who I am. Yeah. And but she's also incredibly artistic. She can do anything, you know, art, artistic. In fact, all of my children, if you challenge them, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> It's a, we were born with the gene that says, yeah. no, we could definitely yeah, we do, do it. <laughs> we'll probably fail a hundred times first, but we could do we'll it. We'll figure it we'll out. We'll figure it out. Right? Oh, and there's lots of things that I've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried. I'm not afraid and see, of and failure. I don't, I don't believe in failure. Let's I fail. think it's a word made up like dark and, and where there's something void of light or cold, where there's something void of heat. Yeah. I, yeah, I just perhaps. think, I think failure is just a word. I, it's, I, it's just a part of the process. I think they're just lessons. You just yeah. learn and you learn what doesn't work and right. you move on. Right. So. And and that's kind of how um, figmentation started. We just we just looked at each other and we we're like, we can do this. We don't know what we're doing, but we'll, we'll figure, figure it out. out. And we have. And we have. So here we are. So here we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Figmentation as as an idea was and we've mentioned this in a previous podcast was William Wainwright's idea. And we we adored this is that this little whole foundation boys, is dedicated to the memory of that sweet little boy. That William little Wainwright. boy's creativity changed the way we looked at costumes because we always dressed as characters and that kind of thing. And cosplay was a big deal in our family because we have a lot of video gamers and a lot of people who are just, you know, the right kind of nerdy. And, and, uh, we just thought that that was, that was fun until William was like, well, but uh, what if I want to design a costume of what I am? Yeah. Who am I? And we went, Oh wow. Why, why haven't we thought of that before? Yeah. Because it was William. William needed to think of it. So that's, yeah, it was um, William. we sat one day and I was talking about creating a nonprofit to teach people how to grow their own food, particularly battered women and teach them how to take some of their power back by, by creating something and growing something. And you were working on donating some of your books to some of the children's hospitals, um, for Bosley Bear. Right. Um, well, I, and, and I had done the book to heroes. Right. Just recently. And, and that was, I wanted to do, I, I, I had already decided that I kind of wanted to do costuming for kids, mm-hmm. you know, because I watched all my kids in their lifetime and the costumes that I built and made for all of them growing up. And I just discovered that it helped little kids. And so, and then working with William. Well, was, and we attended a couple of, of the Fanex, the Salt Lake Fanex Comic Cons. As um, and we just put some you put some costumes together for like a hundred dollars. Like her hiccup costume was very yeah, inexpensive. We, I don't um, think you can see him. So yeah, that's that's a hockey mask and a bleach bottle and a bunch of like sculpey clay. And she's she can take garbage and turn it into a costume. She really can. 
Yeah. So we, yeah. so that was it for me. Yeah. That was kind of the precipice was. We'd gotten to go to Comic-Con that year yeah. and everybody really enjoyed the whole process. And it was, it was kind of surprising the way children viewed you when you were in a costume. Yeah. In fact, um, my son, Ryan, who I made the costume um, for, for mm-hmm. Comic-Con said he didn't realize the celebrity status that the costume made him have with children running up and wanting to hug. Right. Hiccup. You know, right. Well, so. and and this was a building with a hundred thousand people passed through there in a couple of days. Right. And they didn't really have any fights. Everybody got along. It didn't matter how much of how many different perspectives were in the room. Cool environment. They they all just were like, you know what? We have something in common, and we enjoy each other's company. And so we saw the way costumes could separate yourself yourself from those those things that you use to put yourself in boxes and give you the opportunity to connect with your fellow man. And so that was that was a big deal. It was really cool. It was a really neat camaraderie. It was a really mm-hmm. cool club sort of feeling of I fit in here. Even right. if you you know, where most people feel awkward and like they don't fit in, but everybody right. there fits in. We have some fans that yeah. that have been in costumes that help us when we do our booths that um, are are nearly nonverbal um, and on the spectrum, and they had no problem communicating once they're in a costume. They have yeah. no problem just being themselves. And it's really interesting to watch them, and you realize how much of the barriers that we put up are part of our identity, and, and, and we put them there to kind of prevent ourselves from getting hurt. But in a costume and in these places, it's, it's a safe space to be yeah. you, and the costume allows you to step out of that. The brain is an amazing thing. The, the, what the brain does, it, it's like um, somebody who has a speech impediment of stuttering. When they sing, they don't stutter. It's amazing how the brain can cross that barrier. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing right. in a costume. There's a barrier that gets crossed, mm-hmm. and it's amazing to watch it happen. It's really cool. I mean, I, I, I equate it to when you've been told, you know, chew on that piece of gum before you take your test uh, while you're studying and then chew on the same or the same flavor of gum the next day when you take your test because your brain will automatically remember, remember that. And the way I see that is because I define my brain as being like a, a library full of filing cabinets. I just gave myself several paths back to the filing cabinet so I find the right one when I yeah, need it. the right path. And it's – it's um, anyways, so that's yeah. – that's kind of an interesting part of so when we did Comic Con the first time and then she helped William and we realized how much of an impact that this costume made on this little boy. Um, and you can see it in his face in the picture that we have. He is so proud of himself. Well, and, and go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say his mama yeah. was one of the first people to point that out. You can see how proud of himself he is. Yeah. That yeah. costume made a massive impact. Well, and William was the kind of little. Uh, uh, boy that that because of what he was going through, he had overwhelming empathy for everybody who was struggling. And he really just wanted to take care of everybody so they didn't have to struggle Mm -hmm. so much. So he really did become his persona. He really, well, he really was his persona. Yeah, yeah, he was. He just revealed it. That's it. The costume just helped him reveal who he really was. And that's kind of what my point was with with some of our fans that have, they, they, they hide themselves and then they wear their costume and they don't have to hide themselves anymore. Right. So we understood all of that, um, and we hadn't really done the research yet on the sciences. We just understood it from a instinctual and experiential kind of basis. We started bouncing ideas back and forth of right. where could we go with this, and, and how did we want it to benefit our community as well as the children within the community. Mm-hmm. And that's when we delve in with both feet. We just dove in and started doing research, and we right. just... Well, we and we pulled it all. Originally, we thought just pictures would be enough. Yeah. But the more we got into it, the more we understood how desperately the child needed to the be acting it play. out. Yeah. And playing in and their how costume. Important that was. And and the story was how we got to the costume anyway. So it was a natural evolution of how figmentation needed to be. Um, and it all started with William saying, yeah. "I don't want to be Hiccup. I want to be me." Yeah. Yeah. I want to so, be. I want to be me. His mom said it was much more like him to want to be a dragon's friend than it was to want to slay a dragon. Yeah. And so that yeah. was, he wanted to be him. Yep. That, so that was awesome. So that's, that's kind of who we are. Um, feel free to, you know, ask some questions and, and we'll get yeah. back to you guys yeah. um, in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe 
to uh, we're going to start releasing podcasts on a pretty regular basis. We're going to do some interviews with our kids, with their parents, with some of our cast and crew. Um, and we're going to see if we can't we can't work on the next kid and the next kid. And and as far as we're concerned, we're not going to stop until this grows into something that that changes the world. Yeah, absolutely. So join us. So join us. Let's it's, change the world. It's going to be a great adventure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.